Hey family, Pastor T here, God bless you. Listen, you're getting ready to hear a powerful message and I wanted to also remind you about the message that is in this book. It released, as you know, on February 6th. It's already number one new release on Amazon in three different categories. If you don't have this book in your life, get it in your life. It is changing the world one whole person at a time. But God bless you for now. I've got a great message that I want you to hear. Check it out. See you soon. Father, we thank you for your love. There's nothing like it. There's nothing that heals like it. There's nothing that fulfills like it. There's nothing that affirms like it. Your goodness and your mercy endures forever. And to know that nothing will ever separate us from that love. Nothing. We're grateful. And Father, may we have a fresh encounter with that radical agape love. Sometimes we forget. And sometimes life will try to throw us curveballs and situations that would attempt to communicate to us the gross falsehood that you don't love us. And the reality of it is you, you know every strand of hair on our head. Before we were even placed in our mother's womb. You were into us. Hallelujah. And it's good to know that you will always be. Be with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to do something a little different today. We thought because we are on the heels of Valentine's Day that we would take this time to encourage and strengthen our community and all those who are watching in the name of love and in the area of love, regardless of whether or not you are married, single, divorced, in a situation, <laughs> or all of the above. We wanted to encourage you. Um, one passage of scripture we'll look at, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation. And that passage is out of Mark chapter 10 and verse 9. And it reads like this, very simply put. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. God bless you. You may be seated. That will, that will be an amen right there. Wow. Wow. Just by a show of hands, we, we just want to do a little poll, if you would. But if you're here and you are married, let me see your hands. <laughs> wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. If you're here and you are single, raise your hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're here and you're in a situation, no, don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. Just keep looking straight ahead, just like it didn't even move you, just, just. <laughs> well, um, I think that Mark chapter 10 and verse 9 is a very loaded verse. And it's more loaded than we know. A lot of times we, we look at that and there is an assumption that this is basically saying if you are married, never separate. And although I do believe in uh, going the distance as God is prescribed and ordained, there is a qualifier in that verse. It says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So what we want to do, you want to say hi to everybody, honey? Hey, child. <laughs> <laughs> what we want to do today is we want to deal with five must-haves before saying I do. Five must-haves before saying I do, because I think that first part, what God has joined together, is very important. Because you have 
some relationships that do not work. And when you do an autopsy on the death of that relationship, and sometimes you do an autopsy on the death of that marriage, sometimes, in some cases, what you will discover in your autopsy is that it was a relationship that God did not join together. Sometimes it was a relationship that brokenness joined together, control joined together, manipulation joined together. And so we are very, very adamant about having certain things in place before you say I do. And if you don't have those things in place, we strongly encourage you to hold up, to slow down. In fact, in wholeness, there's a chapter in the book called Two Halves Don't Make a Whole, where these five must-haves before saying I do are talked about in great detail. But we don't want to leave it there because we realize that from what we saw, about half of the room have already said I do. And so we, we've got something for you. We also have today five must-haves after saying I do. Isn't that cool? So we want to get into them. So we're going to talk to the people who are, let me see those hands again, single people slash in a situation, single, all right, okay. We're going to talk to you first, and we're going to give you the five must-haves before saying I do. I'm just curious, how many people are engaged? If you're here and you're in between single and married, you're engaged. Let me see your hands. Wow, this is good. This is good. This is good. I think for both married people and engaged people, I think that you ought to work this process. Be brave enough. See, sometimes you don't want to be brave. You, you, sometimes, what, what is it, honey? Well, you're afraid that if you put your relationship under the microscope that it won't pass the test. Mm. So you choose to just kind of keep it surface. Mm. But I think the strength of our relationships, the roots of our relationship must be tested and qualified because life is coming to qualify that connection. Children will qualify that connection. Cancer will qualify that connection. Job loss will challenge that connection. So as much as we can put our relationships under the microscope and say, what is this really? I know we like the same movies, but what is this really? I think the better off we are at withstanding the vicissitudes of life. Absolutely. Yes, vicissitudes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look that up. <laughs> no, but it, it's true. Um, relationships will make you or break you. Uh, who you decide to spend the rest of your life with is a huge decision. Are you tracking with me? It's not like I, I feel this and so let me do it. It's not like that. It's a big deal. You are signing up for this thing called forever. And so you, you can't be intimidated. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just like to bring decisions and just drag them to the altar so that the light of God and the fire of God can fall down on that relationship or any decisions that it might be and purify that thing. That's what the altar did. The altar didn't consume everything. The altar consumed everything that was unprofitable. Yeah so that that which was profitable can remain. And so, so I'm going to challenge you, you lovebirds who are engaged. First, and those of you who are single but have a desire to be married, that you qualify the relationship that you're in or the relationship that you're pursuing with these five qualifiers. Yeah? Yes. All right. Let's jump into them. Okay. You want me to start? You're going to start. You go first. Okay. The first thing that you have to have, and this is pretty basic, is this thing called chemistry. Right? When God is bringing two people together together, there will be an element of chemistry. What is chemistry? Chemistry is when something, you, you feel like something beyond you is happening between you. You tracking with me? It's, it's something, I, I, there's something going on there. I can't quite figure it out, but I am greatly intrigued by this, right? Is that like flirting? Well, flirting is, is a whole nother thing. You oh. know, the, the reason why chemistry is the first thing and not the whole thing, is that you can have chemistry with 175 different people in one day. You, you can have chemistry based on physical attraction. 
You can have chemistry based on mutual interests. You can have chemistry based on things that, that stimulate you intellectually. You share in that. So chemistry is, is the first step, but chemistry has to be qualified. Can we keep it 100 in here today? I know we're at church, but the reason why, one of the reasons why we're sitting down and we're wearing jeans with holes in them is because we're going to keep it 175% in here today. Now, you can have chemistry with more than one person. Hello, somebody. Chemistry is tricky. And you have to watch it, and you have to guard it, and you have to be careful, especially, let me just cross over into the marriage, especially when you're married, be careful for, chem for, for chemistry. Sometimes, you know, you can feel a little something, you go, I, I, I got to leave that thing alone right there. Because there's some stuff there, and you don't know. It could be some spiritual thing trying to take your marriage down. Are you tracking with me? This, see, the chemistry could be witchcraft. How, how deep can we go today? I wanted go to kind of keep child. it. No, go deep. It, it could be witchcraft. Because if God did bring you together, then there's going to be an assault against it. And sometimes what God uses is chemistry. You know, you, you, you're, at, you're at work, and you're at the water cooler. Okay? You're at the water cooler, and... and and, you know, and, and someone, you, you, you walk up at the same time and, and, and someone drops, the person that's next to you drops their pin on the ground. And, and, and the two of you go down at the same time to pick up the pin, bump heads, and then look at each other in the eyes. <laughs> that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. <laughs> I don't mean anything. So you have to be careful with chemistry, and chemistry has to be qualified, and chemistry brings us to the next thing, and that is connection. What do you think about connection, honey? Well, I think that when you cover it in the book that you really go into great detail discussing beyond chemistry, which as Pastor had already defined as just having that moment, connection is when you have this... this like a draw. Draw yeah. between one... I have connection with you. you. We do have great that connection. That was one of the things that made me really um, begin to investigate further what could happen between you and I because there was this connection that seemed deeper than just, you know, I think that we could laugh together. Like, I think we could do life together. I like the way life looks through his eyes. I like who I am when I am in his presence. I like who I am becoming as a result of, of, of us being connected. And I think that one of the things that I'm always conscious of telling people about when we speak about relationships and marriage is that who you are connected to is very important because there's a transference. And sometimes we are connected to people who we would not necessarily want to become, but because we think we can grow them up, we allow ourselves to be connected to what ultimately becomes poison, and then we wonder what's happened to our own souls and perspective. So true. I remember the first time I felt connection to Sarah. This is after we met. The first time that we met, and again, it's here, and I did a video called Five Keys to Identifying Your Soul. It has like 3.1 million views on YouTube. I encourage you to watch that too, but the book gets more into detail. But uh, chemistry, I had chemistry when we met for the first time, but not connection. It was just an acknowledgement that, wow, you know, she's super special, and I feel, you know, somewhat, you know, there's something there, but it wasn't romantic at all. The first time I felt connection, however, was we were at um, a conference. I think it was Pastors and Leaders uh, Conference in 2014, and we were sitting next to each other in this conference, and, uh, and Bishop Jakes was officiating, and it was time to close out the conference, and he had, uh, he had everyone grab the hand of the person who's next to them, and, uh, and Sarah, <coughs> Sarah <laughs> just so happened to be <coughs> the person who I was sitting next to. And the craziest thing happens, I reach over to take her hand, and when I took her hand, our hands fit perfectly. And it was like I was not holding the hand of a stranger. It was like I was holding a hand of somebody that I knew, someone who had always been a part of my life. It was crazy, and I think for me, that was the first time I really, really felt like, wow, connected to her. And then, you know, obviously, we, you know, a few weeks later, we had dinner in L.A., and, uh, and then upon, we shut the restaurant down, and then upon leaving dinner, uh, I left, and I knew that, that there was, honestly, that she was supposed to be a part of my life for the rest of my life. So you got to have connection. Yes. 
And the third one is wholeness. And what I love about this verse, babe, that you picked, therefore, what God has joined together, I know we use that as it relates to two people coming together, but I think wholeness is when God joins you together as an individual and you become whole. So when we talk about the need to have wholeness and we go back to the scripture, it says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. If you are with another whole individual, you don't have to worry about them separating what God has begun to join together on the inside of you. And so it's important that you have a sense of wholeness and that they have a sense of wholeness. What does that mean? That means that I'm not trying to recover from my last relationship while building my new relationship at the same time. What does wholeness mean? It means that I've come to a place where I accepted that my father wasn't the best father, but I still became a whole individual as a result of it, where you have assessed your life and your relationship with God in such a way that you know who you are and you don't offer discounts and you maintain who you are regardless of whether you're single or in a relationship. Incredible. And the reason why um, wholeness comes after connection is because that connection has to be qualified. I mean, it seems like, I mean, that, that's, that's the happy story, right? Well, I held her hand, and it was like magic. Our, our hands fit perfectly together, and it just seemed like we had been in one another's lives for all of our lives. And from that moment forward, <laughs> we were destined to be together. And all that's wonderful. And in our, and, and in our case, in that instance, it was true. But that connection needed to be qualified because there's this thing called codependency. Wow. And codependency does a stellar job masquerading as love. Oh, I mean, a, a wonderful job. So my connection has to be qualified. What is connecting me to you? What is it really? Is it the Lord? Or is it the fact, to your point, Sarah, that I didn't get enough hugs from my dad? Or, or my dad didn't give me affirmation, and so, so what is, or my mom, or what, however it might be. And so is what is drawing me to you godly and healthy, or is my brokenness making this thing look like love? And so you have to have wholeness. And I think that one of the key signs for wholeness pre-marriage is having this testimony, that you can say this, from the bottom of your heart, mean it. I'm good all by myself. If I never meet my partner, my soulmate, my spouse, I am good. Me and you, Jesus, are good enough. You have joined me together. You've mended my broken pieces. I am affirmed by you. I'm loved by you. I understand who I am. I know who I am in Christ. If Romeo does not come through, if Juliet is delayed, I am good all by myself. Me and you will worship. Me and you will take walks together. I will date me. I will go to the movies all by myself. I will have Netflix and chill with me and be good with it because I am not needy. And I honestly believe that until you can really say that and mean it, you may not be ready to say, I do. And it's a wonderful thing. God says, love the Lord. What is, you know, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, thou shalt love the Lord with all of your heart with all of your mind, with all of your strength, right? Another translation says, with all of your soul. In other words, the most valuable thing that you can do in life is love God first with everything that you are. And then he says, and when you do that, then the second commandment, right? This is sequence. The second commandment is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right? So in other words, my relationship with God determines and heals my relationship with myself. And my relationship with myself becomes the benchmark by which I have a relationship with others. So I have to get my vertical relationship right first so that I can love me right first so that I can be my own Valentine first. And then when I am my own Valentine, my eyes are clear for me to see 
where my other Valentine might be. Does that make sense? So wholeness is everything. What's the next one, honey? The next one is divine confirmation. Mm. And that's when God endorses your relationship. And I will just give you a story very quickly. I uh, was divorced when Pastor and I met. I was a single mother with my two children in Texas. And we had all of those things. We had chemistry, connection. I had wholeness. But I was still wondering, you know, God, is this really you? And as a single mother, I was helping my children to just navigate their relationship with their biological fathers. And my son was expressing to me in that moment, you know, I, I realized that I may not ever have, like, the ice cream dates out at the park. And literally in that moment, as he was saying that, I looked down at my phone and my husband sent me a picture of him out with his son with ice cream. They had the ice cream cones in their hand. And I just knew that that was God already going ahead of me saying that I've made a provision to fix the holes that are being created through you know, that situation that my children were in. And we had countless moments like that where it was just God saying, I've, I've already covered that part. I'm, I'm, I already got you covered there. And um, I think that that was one of my many divine confirmations. There were a lot of them, babe. Yeah. I mean, and that takes us back to Mark 10 and 9. It says, therefore, what God has joined together, what God has caused to be one. It says, what God has you can't play with that. You can't play with that. Because if God doesn't do it, there is a possibility that it won't work. And you're going to be torn because you joined yourself together. You know, I've got that, that teaching on sexual wholeness. If you haven't watched that, I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch that message. But, but sexual wholeness deals with soul ties, and there's nothing wrong with the soul tie, being connected, having your soul connected to someone, if it's the person that God has ordained for you. Yeah. If it isn't, then we, you and I, have, a, have the power to join ourselves, watch this, illegally. Wow. Illegally. What do I mean by illegally? It's simple. The one that God didn't join you. The one that God didn't anoint for you to be joined with. You can join yourself illegally, and now, when the separation comes, you're torn. You're torn and you're broken and you have to be whole again because you didn't seek God. So, so when we say divine confirmation, we mean that. When God is bringing two people together, heaven will back up. Heaven will endorse the fact that this is what God is doing. And I don't know about you, but I'm at a point in my life that I don't want anything brought into my life that God didn't bring. You know. I like those old gangster movies back in the day when, when someone would come in and try to kill, you know, and, you know, would try to kill somebody, you know, and they would get the person and they would say, who sent you? You remember that? The old gangster movie? No, you know, you know, I, I, I like. They say they don't watch gangster movies. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's gangster all, movies don't come it's all on TBN, TBN for you. I, I got it. I, that's wonderful. I love TBN. But I like gangster movies sometimes, too. And there's some of the moments, and you know, and they finally catch the guy that's trying to kill them, and, and he's smacking them around saying, who sent you? I'll never tell. Who sent you? You know, for me, <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, Anything that comes into my life, I want to know who the sender was. Was this God or did my brokenness attract you to me? And so divine confirmation. Now, divine confirmation can get a little tricky because sometimes you can want something so bad that you will make up some confirmation. If I see two birds today, that will be a sign to me that God wants the two of us to be together. No, I'm not talking about stuff that, that you want so bad that you create a divine confirmation, right? I want it to be where you let the relationship go. Ooh, I feel like preaching. Go ahead, I feel like, let me just, for just one second, one second, one second. I want it to be where you, and you may not necessarily have to tell the other party that you are letting them go. But in your heart, while you are waiting for divine confirmation, that you pause and you stop and you say, God, I am giving you my heart back. 
I, I, know, I, I love this person, right? I love them, but you know what? I'm loving you more. And I'm going to give you my heart so that I can be in this neutral place and not allow my feelings for the person that I'm seeking confirmation about to get in the way and hinder my ability to hear what you are saying. And when you're in that neutral place, whole and complete, and God all by yourself, then you will be in a position to hear clearly and get that divine confirmation that God has no problem bestowing upon you. So number five is a sense of purpose. And I think that when you and I got together, one of the things that really drawed us together was that we just had the same heart for God in this generation. We were both walking in our purpose, so we knew what it would take for us to have a partner that understood our purpose and what God had called us to do on the earth. Sometimes you get in relationships and you discover your purpose while you're in the relationship and the person has to begin to try to form their life around your purpose because what God has called you to do is more important than who you're in relationship with. Say that again, like, Pastor. We are here on earth to serve a purpose, to be a light, to make a change in this world. We're not in, I know it's on ABC, I know Disney has sold us on this fairy tale that we're supposed to be here to find our boo when we find our boo and live happily ever after. When God put us in this earth, he said that there's something that they can do that no one else can do but them. And it's not just to be in a relationship. I need them to change the world for the better. I need them to raise a child that changes the world. I need them to erect a church. I need them to serve in a ministry that makes the ministry grow and become better. They have ideas and purpose and intentionality. And so when you begin to tap into your purpose, you have to recognize that whoever I'm called to has to understand that first I'm called. Whoever's called to me has to understand that I'm called. And so a pastor and I were certainly walking in our purpose, but I also think that as we came together that we recognized that our union was God's purpose as well. Absolutely. That, that's, that's so key. I think that if you don't at least have an inkling of, of what you're called to, to be and to do on the earth, you're not ready for marriage. You're really not. Because, first of all, it's not fair. Because you, to a certain degree, are selling your partner a lie. You're selling your partner a lot. They're buying into cookies and, 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 and chocolate-covered strawberries. And they're buying into, you know, you guys are you're hanging out all the time. And you're in love and you're dating and all these sort of things. They're buying into the fact that they're going to have you. When the reality of it is when purpose gets a hold of you, purpose has you. And now it's not fair to that person because you've sold them on this love story without discovering your purpose and what can happen. And, and this is, would be tragic in either way this goes. But, but what happens if one day you wake up and you discover your purpose and you realize that the person that you have signed up with is actually a hindrance to the thing that God has called you to do? What do you do then? So by, by any means necessary... You know, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Here are the two options. Either you can sacrifice the purpose for the relationship. Or have to go through the difficult process yeah. if that relationship is not redeemable of sacrificing the relationship for purpose. And neither are fun. And that's why you must. It is imperative. I'm not saying you got to have your life figured out. I'm not saying that at all. But have a general sense of what God is is doing in and through your life, right? A sense of purpose. So these are, you know, and there could be 50, there could be 100, there could be 205. But these are, are the five must-haves before saying I do that we uh, place in the book and that we're talking about. I, I do have a couple of caveats that I want to say. Uh, one is obviously... You know, um, this is not the end-all, be-all, but it is a great start, right? I want to say that to those who are engaged or those who are single, those who are engaged, I encourage you to have a vision for your marriage. We have all those, and we don't get a chance to, to do premarital counseling with many people, maybe two or three couples a year. Um, but one of the things that is a requirement f for us from them 
is that they write out a vision for your marriage, right? Because you'd be surprised how many perspectives on marriage there are out there. And you're coming in with one perspective, which means that you're coming in with this particular expectation. And so is that other person. And what happens, you have to have that conversation first. Because the last thing you want to do is be in the marriage and you're saying, oh, I thought it was supposed to be this. Or I thought it was about that. So I have a vision for your marriage. Here's another thing I'll say. And I'll say this to people who are married. And as you are hearing this, you're saying, man, we, you know, we, we miss some of these things. I don't want you to be questioning your marriage. Not necessarily. I don't want you to be like, oh, well, baby, we didn't have that. And we didn't have this. Here is my out. <laughs> <laughs> The devil is a liar. We're not doing that because one of the things that we understand about God is that God is a restorer and God is a redeemer. And sometimes man plans his way, but God establishes his goings. Are you tracking with me? So, so I, I want you to understand that there are many cases where you didn't have that, but God calls all things to work together for good. Hello, somebody. It's true that God calls all things to work together for good in spite of this. So I just want to throw that caveat out there so you won't be taking a sound bite of this and, and be in divorce court, right? Hello, somebody. And, but I also want to affirm those who, who have been through a divorce who might be walking around with guilt and shame and condemnation. Some psycho religious person told you that because you are remarried again, you know, you're going to hell. Stop it. Let me just say it publicly. Stop taking the scripture out of context. Hello, somebody. There are more reasons than adultery for people to get divorced, right? Even in Mark 10, I'm on my soapbox, but even in Mark 10, it, it talks about how there is no one. Peter was struggling about all the things that he would have to give up in order to satisfy his kingdom assignment. And guess what? When Jesus told him that there will be certain things that he may have to give up for the kingdom's sake, but it would be multiplication, not loss, guess what? One of the things had to do with wife. And so what I'm saying is there are a lot of people who are uh, so blinded to the fact that the commander and the commanded are more important than the commandment. I feel like preaching. And, and you take things so, uh, uh, you, you become legalistic by taking things so literally. I'll put it to you this way. If adultery was the only reason for divorce, do you mean to tell me if somebody is beating you upside the head with a hammer that God would say, no, stay in it. As long as he doesn't cheat on you, he can be beating the crap out of you. But as Sometimes you got to think. You got to think. Somebody's verbally abusing you. Somebody's treating you. Somebody's speaking against your purpose and your destiny. So there are other things. So that, so that person who had gone through a divorce, maybe you went through a divorce because God didn't join you guys together in the first place. And I want you to be healed and whole and redeemed and set free from that guilt, shame, and condemnation because it's not from heaven. Are you tracking with me? I'm not excusing anything nor am I condoning religiosity that keeps people in chains. We good. All right, let's move on to the five must-haves before saying, I do. The first one, I love. Regularly rehearse magic moments. Regularly rehearse magic moments. Okay, so what are magic moments. Magic moments are these memorable experiences that you've had together. Magic moments could be moments of confirmation where, where God confirmed that the two of you were supposed to be together. He could have done some sort of sign in the sky, some sort of experience. You have to not only keep record of those magic moments, but you have to rehearse them because guess what? You don't always have magic moments. Sometimes you will have, somebody said miserable moments. I, I wouldn't go that far, but sometimes that might be true. You see how I'm keeping my voice right here and low like that. <laughs> Let's say sometimes you have moments that are less than magical. And, 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 and oftentimes what we do, the second part of that was to learn to 
to magnify each other's strengths and trivialize each other's weaknesses. You know, one of the things that can happen in marriage is you, you can have an incredible spouse, an incredible partner. I mean, they are awesome in 95% of what they bring to the marriage, what they bring to the relationship. But it's that 5%, that, 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 that one thing, or maybe it's two things, and they are so irritating. And don't, you just keep looking straight ahead. Don't nudge your partner. Don't nudge it just right here. We're not, don't, we're, we are not offering counseling after service, okay? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's that one, it's those one or two things that drive you absolutely crazy and if we're not careful we will focus on those things and magnify those things so big that in your mind in your perspective they dwarf that which is really dwarfing those things and so find times rehearse listen a good story about your marriage a good memory a good recounting of a memorable experience is never overplayed. Yeah. It's never outdated. Your relationship needs it. Talk, you remember when? And then if you gotta do it again a day later, <laughs> because you're struggling, because you're magnifying that one or two things that the person is doing, you gotta do it again. You remember, baby, we just talked about it. I know, <laughs> but I need it, right? So regularly rehearse magic moments. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think we do that a lot. I think we the do. beauty of technology and taking pictures a lot is that you can literally go back through and remember how you felt when you were on that road trip or when you had that special dinner. And it has really helped me. I mean, there are very few small, like 0.09% things that I would consider a weakness of yours, 0.09% of the overall picture. I got to go home with him, so I need to make sure. Don't nobody get it but him, 0.09%. And when the enemy would dare to enlarge that 0.09% on days that I am tired or hungry, um, <laughs> I am reminded of, of memories. I always tell people that when Pastor and I went on our first date that he looked at me like I had wings that only he could see. And... He does still look at me like that sometimes, even when my hair is tied up and I got stuff on my face. And so just reminding myself in those moments where I could dare to be irritated that there's magic in the mix of life. Absolutely. Regularly rehearse magic moments. They are a gift for your future. What's number two, baby? So number two is one that um, I came up with and it says be more mate aware than me aware. Say that again, baby. Be more mate aware than me aware. When life starts doing that thing that life does and you start counting the cost and the weight of what it takes for you to be you. I took the kids to school. I went and worked out. I made your mom dinner. I went to work. I had 12 phone calls and I went and picked the kids up and went back to the grocery store because I forgot something. I came home. I cooked dinner. I did so-and-so's hair. And you had the nerve to come in the kitchen and ask me when dinner was going to be ready. You know, in that moment, it can feel like me, 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 me. And I have been challenged by, you know, challenged within myself to take a minute and to just take inventory of his day and where he was when he came in. Maybe he had meeting after meeting after meeting and didn't have dinner and he wasn't like acting like this taskmaster asking me about dinner. Instead, he was just asking a simple question. But because I brought my own weight of the day into that moment, we struggled. And I think another thing when we're being more mate aware than me aware is to also consider what love and and family look like for him growing up because there are moments where there is a disagreement and you just don't understand why he's not getting what you're saying but you have to recognize that he's bringing all of his experiences and all of his perspectives about life into a statement when he says I don't need you to cook dinner I need you to give me a hug and you're thinking well I did all of this and how come you didn't recognize it you have to recognize that what matters to you may not matter to him and so dare to look at life look look at life and look at you through his perspective. And just for my wives, I have a book that I think would be very helpful 
for you to read besides wholeness, <laughs> which you need to read, amen. But it's a book called What's It Like to Be Married to Me? And uh, it will really change your life in a way that I don't know if you're ready for, but you get a journal book and you go through this book and it gives you great perspective. So true. Uh, there is a passage in one of the epistles of Peter uh, that talks about marriage and it, uh, it's in reference to husband and wives, but I believe it works in the other direction. But it says, husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge. That's heavy. Live with your wives, not just randomly, but according to knowledge. And I believe that that uh, to Sarah's point, we do have to be aware. I think that God will give us insight about our spouse. I really do, if we're, if we're interested, if we're curious. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's happening on the inside of my wife or my husband, right? Let me just, Lord, help me to remove myself out of the equation for a second. And, and help me, God, help me to to see them. I believe it's the same thing with parents, right? You're praying for your children. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's happening inside my child so that I can minister to my child. It's the same thing. Because I believe, as we get ready to move on to the next point, I believe that the best marriages, the best relationships is when you have two people doing everything in their power to make the other person happy. Are you tracking with me? A lot of times when we, t we poll people and we ask them about marriage and, you know, and what, do you know, what do you want? You know, what do you want in marriage? And they'll say, oh, I, you know, well, I want a man who loves me and, and he validates me and he, he sees me and he gets me and he's, you know, he's six, two or three or five and, you know, he's got seven figures or eight figures or whatever, you know, and then you ask the husband, you know, I just want somebody that, that knows how to cook, you know what I mean, and, and can be, you know, a lady in the streets and... And, uh, and something else at home, you know. And, <laughs> and oftentimes, it is so <laughs> I'm sorry. And oftentimes, I'll tell you what you rarely hear. You rarely hear someone saying, you know what? You know, what do I want out of marriage? You know, I just want to be, I want to find someone who I can just be the best husband to that I can just provide for, that I can just create an environment for them to flourish in. You know, you rarely hear that. You always hear about what they want. And so I think this is important because again, the best marriage, the best relationship is two people doing everything in their power to make the other person happy. Um, number three is compete in generosity, which I think really speaks more to what we just talked about, you know? And so, so instead of competing in the marriage or complaining in the marriage, how about we compete? How about we outdo each other? You know, my wife, you know, I wasn't a really good gift giver. I, I really wasn't, to be honest with you. I'd throw some money at you, you know, or, or you know, I, just, I just didn't know how to be. And my wife gives the most thoughtful gifts in the world, so it upped my game a little bit, right? <laughs> And so now I'm like thinking months, you know, in advance, I'm, I'm thinking. And so, so compete in generosity. How can I be even more generous with my spouse than I was last year? And one of the things that I think allows us to compete in generosity is constantly asking one another the question, how can I serve you? Mm -hmm. How can I serve you? So competing in generosity for us isn't like who gets the most expensive gift, but like I got him a newspaper that came out the year that he was born that was very special to him and his, well, to his parents at the time and just was the environment in which he was born. And I know that that meant a lot to him. So I wanted him to have a piece of his history. It's not always the most extravagant gifts, but it's the thing that says, I see you. I understand where you come from. I understand where you're headed. And this is my way of saying, I got you. I'm with you and I'm supporting you. And there are pockets throughout our whole entire day where we get to compete in generosity. Sometimes as wives, as simple as just sending your husband a message like, thank you for taking the trash out. 
Like, I know that's a part of their responsibility, and it's a, our way of helping keep the house maintained, but the reality is it's the man who took the trash out and never came home. So I thank you for taking the trash out and coming back inside <laughs> and sitting down at the dinner table. I'm glad that you came home. It's somebody's man who didn't come home, and I thank you that you saw past my flaws and insecurities and last night's argument and still came home and still honored me as your wife. I know that this is your role, and this is what you're supposed to do, but what I'm saying is that I see you stepping up to the plate in a way that a lot of men have failed to do, or some men have failed to do, and what I'm saying is I see you, I honor you, and I thank you, I have gratitude for who you are in my life. Awesome. Now, we've got two more, but before we do the two more, I just believe that, uh, that we have a guru in our family that has, is it 35 or 34 years? 35. 35 years of marriage that I want us to hear from really quickly. So let's hear from our bishop, T.D. Jakes. There are a couple of things that I have learned over the 35 years that I have been married to Serena Jakes. Uh, I have learned that so many times as men, we think more love than we say. And people can't live off of what you think about them. They can only live off of what you say about them. I learned that if you have love for them, be sure you give it to them. And the only way they can get it is if you have the courage to verbalize it. And we as men have a tendency to be nonverbal and then be disappointed because people didn't catch how we felt. I learned to break through my intimidation and become more verbal because I found out that my attention and my affection is literally the air she breathes. And when I don't give that attention and affection, I asphyxiate her. If you don't want to smother the person you love through the absence of something that you have but wouldn't release, give it to them. The second thing I want to share with you that I believe is also very, very valuable is that a woman processes by talking. That's how they process. Most men tend to process internally and then come out with a conclusion. I learned that when she is processing, I don't need to contribute. I just need to listen because there is something you give a woman by listening. It gives her, it validates her thoughts and it gives her the very important thing of feeling, not only women, everybody needs this, that I have been heard. I have been heard. So it's not always about talking. It's also about listening. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number four. Make up quick. The Bible says for us not to let the sun go down on our wrath. You know, in, uh, in that passage, Mark 10 and 9, which says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. That's an interesting word that was translated, uh, let not man separate. You probably heard it say, let not man put asunder. But it's a Greek word, and it literally means to place room between. To place room between. So what God has joined together, what God has forged and formed together, what God has caused to be one, let not man. Now, let not man put room between. Now, he's not talking about simply man that's outside of the relationship. He's talking about you. And I can't think of what puts more room and space, which creates opportunity for the enemy to come in and do things than Failing to commit to making up quick. What does that look like? I, I don't, you know, if you got to talk it out all night. If you, watch this, if you have to surrender your right to be right in order to bring harmony, in order to bring peace, do it. Do it by any means necessary. Make up. Are you tracking with me? Because sometimes you're fighting over something that's not even worth it. I wanted more mayonnaise on my sandwich. You know that I wanted mayonnaise. You know I like the mayonnaise to come all the way to the edge of the bread. You know that. We have been married for 72 years. You should know that. Some things are not worth it. And one of the things that I've learned that sometimes in order to keep the peace, you have to just die to things. Are you tracking with me? Some things, watch this, you don't like this. Some things are just not going to change. They're just not going to change. You might want them to change. Don't clap too hard. Don't, don't get in trouble. 
We're going to have to have a counseling session right after the service, right? No, some things, right? And I'm not talking about major things, right? I'm not talking about things like abuse, like verbal abuse, like, like certain things. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about little things that are more like preferences, right? Sometimes you got to just do workarounds, but by any means necessary, make up quick. Sometimes I pride saying, well, no, I'm not, I'm not giving in on this one. I, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not giving in. As if you are hurting them. To hurt your spouse is to hurt you. You guys are one, remember? We're on the same team. So be quick to make up. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to sleep angry. First of all, it does not make for good sleep. When was the last time you went to sleep mad and slept like a baby? No. You tossed and you turned. And the beautiful thing about making up before you go to sleep is that you get to have fun doing it. Hallelujah. <laughs> You'll get that on the 25 on your way home. God bless you. And last but not least... <laughs> Somebody just caught it. You know what, baby? I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew I was a little mean this morning. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> when you pray that there will be transparency and authenticity in church, this is what you get. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is what you get. No, but he certainly lives by this. I, my parents have never argued in front of me. They both grew up in physically abusive homes, and so one of the things that they vowed to do was never to argue or to have any kind of disputes in front of their children, which is great. It's just that I don't know how to process when I had high emotions, you know, and so I thought to myself, I will just be quiet and internalize. So the idea of making up quickly for me just meant just don't say anything at all and, you know, let it go. And so I would obviously be walking around with an attitude, but I wouldn't say what was wrong with me, you know, like slamming this plate down, here's your dinner, you know, or leaving it in the pot and not making this plate at all, like, mm-hmm, it's over there. And, um, <laughs> and so he had to really help me to make up quickly, but I just remember earlier on in our marriage, one of the times that I really understood how important this was to him. We had just had the baby and I wasn't sleeping very much and I, you know, he usually doesn't sleep very much at night ever, like, but when the baby came, God just blessed him with the spirit of sleep that was so <laughs> powerful and anointed. And so he would be waking up stretching and like, I'm about to go to the gym and I had been up on this, I had an attitude, okay? My petty game was on 100. And so, um, I think it was a Saturday night and I finally just had this huge breakdown and he literally called in a guest speaker for that next Sunday and he told, we, I think we did a video to the congregation, he's like, I'm staying home and we're gonna have a family day because he's like, I'm not gonna go and grab a microphone and preach and do three services like everything's okay at home when it's not. So whatever it takes for us to make up, we're gonna do. Absolutely, yeah, marriage is everything. And lastly, Remember, marriage is stewardship. It's stewardship. God has entrusted you with somebody he loves. He has created a scenario where you have close proximity to someone's entire life, to their most intimate things. It's stewardship. What God has joined together, he did it for a reason. And so I have stewardship over my wife. I've got to, as a husband, I've got to make sure she's good. I've got to be unto her as Christ is to me. I've got to create an environment where she soars, where she excels. It's a huge responsibility. I think that if we saw this going in, we might be a little slower to rush into marriage, right? And not do it, you know, unadvisedly. We do it soberly. And so remember that God's entrusted you with a life. He's entrusted you with a heart. And God loves you. Yes, he does. But he also loves your spouse. And so, so you have to see it that way. Okay, I'm in her life. I'm in his life for a reason. And ultimately, I'm in her life. I'm in his life to bless them. Yes. 
I think constantly reminding yourself, I may be the only glimpse of God that he sees today. So how can I be more forgiving? How can I be more patient? How can I be more sensitive? How can I be more honest and transparent is something that has really helped me as I continue to just thank God each and every day that I get to be your wife. Well, I love you. It's an honor to be your husband. All righty. Was this helpful? Well, we are, we are about done. Um, there, was one, there was a testimony that came through the launch team, and there was a couple on the brink of divorce, and they were on the brink of divorce because of brokenness. And they decided that they were going to, they read the first three chapters, they won the launch team, and they read the first three chapters, and they realized that they weren't in a position to get a divorce because they were seeing everything through broken lenses. And literally, this turn their relationship around. And now they are reading this together, seeking wholeness even in their marriage. Yes. I encourage couples to read it together. You, you never know. What if the reason why there is struggle in certain areas is because of some degree of brokenness that has gone undetected? I encourage you to read it. Single people, chapter seven is for you. The whole book is for you, but single people, particularly those who might be engaged and you're preparing to get married, read it, check it out. It doesn't mean that this book is going to tell you not to get married, but it might tell you to slow down and get some things in order so that you can have the marriage that God wants you to have. And so I want to encourage you. What I'd like to do is pray for marriages. And I can do it while you're where you are, but if you're so inclined, I want to pray. Actually, I want to pray for a lot of people. First group I want to pray for are divorced people. If you're here and you're divorced and you have been struggling with shame, you, you don't feel like God will ever bring love into your life again, and you've been wrestling with self-doubt, you've even been wrestling with this notion that, oh my God, this was this great evil, this was the unpardonable sin and you've been carrying guilt and shame, I want you to come down and meet me here at this altar. The second group I want to come down is if you're here and you're in a relationship and you don't know if the relationship is God or not, but you want to give God your heart. You want to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength so that he can either confirm or not confirm the relationship that you're in. You heard something. It was very clear that God was speaking to you throughout this time and before you, you go in too far before you take another step further you want to give God your heart you want God to be your first valentine and your own self to be your second valentine if that's you I would like for you to come and if you're here and you're married and you just want us to pray over your marriage it's not an indictment on how awesome your marriage is or how much difficulty you have in it but you just want there's a blessing in this house for marriages and I said it before one of the first things that I said when Pastor Sarah and I took over this church is that this church is going to be known for healthy marriages and families in Jesus name we are going to be known for it so if that's you and you just want prayer for your marriage I want you to come forward right now and if you're here and you are single and you want to be okay with it. You want to come to a place where you say, God, if you bring the right one for me, fine. If me and you are going to do purpose and destiny all by ourselves for this season, fine. I want to be cool with it. If that's you, I want you to come as well. I want you to come forward. Hallelujah. If you're watching via live stream, we're praying for you as well. You are very much a part of this. I think we should both pray. I'll start it and then you can finish it. And you can just come while we're talking, come while we're praying. Father, love is an incredible thing. It is an incredible gift that you've given to your children. It's so powerful that your word says that by the love that we have for each other, then people will know that the Father sent Jesus to the earth. 
Lord, you said, I am love. Yet in the midst of that truth, you did not promote love between two people over love between yourself and individuals. In fact, before Adam even fell in love with Eve, he was already in love with you. You set that sequence on purpose because you want us to understand that the greatest relationship that any of us will ever have in life, the greatest love affair, is the love affair between you and ourselves. And it is satisfying. It is fulfilling. It is completing. People don't complete people. You complete us. And when two complete people get together, they have a complete marriage. Father, there may be some amongst us who have gone through divorce. And as a result of that, they have been torn in such a way that they, that they do not believe that not only can they recover, but that you will do even greater things. And Father, I pray that you would uproot that lie right now. You are a God of healing and restoration. And I pray, God, that self-forgiveness would flow right now. That there would be no regrets. That there would be no guilt. That there would be no shame. That they would know, in spite of perhaps even mistakes that they made, Maybe the greatest mistake was entering into it without seeking you. In spite of that, you love them, you care for them, and you've got a plan for them. May that guilt and that shame die here at the altar of grace. Hallelujah. That regret would lift and that a true sense of optimism and expectation for all that you have in front of them would be realized. Father, let joy return to us, that we may remember the promises that you have for our life, for our marriages, for our children, and for our hearts. May we constantly walk in the knowledge and the confidence that you created all things to work together for our good. And that even the things that caused us the most harm, the things that made us become uh, disappointed or bitter, that you know how to take those things and to reveal to us not only a new version of who you are, but love like no other. We receive those promises. We lay hold of them and we rebuke every lie, every plot and plan and thought of the enemy that ever made us think that we were less than. And we declare and decree over these, your sons and daughters, that they are loved they are accepted, they are affirmed, and therefore they can walk with their head held high and their heart full of joy in Jesus' name. And then Father, I pray for every marriage here, every marriage in this house. You said what you have joined together, what you have caused to no longer be two, but one, you said, May there be no room, no space between them. Father, there are some here, and, and because of whatever, maybe something that happened years ago that has been a wedge in between their relationship, causing room and space and cracks and brokenness, unforgiveness that would allow the enemy to always have a straight shot and place in their marriage. I pray today that that door would be closed, that love and grace and forgiveness, God, restoration, God, recall to their remembrance those magic moments, those moments of confirmation, those moments of love, the moments that are the reason they got married in the first place. Restore that back to your sons and daughters. And then, God, for those who are here, who are single, we pray, God, that they would see single differently, yeah. that single would not be alone or by myself 
or some sort of disadvantage, but that they would see their singleness as wholeness and that they would pursue wholeness in their singleness. That singleness would mean unbroken. That singleness would mean I have an opportunity to love me well and to love me right and to love me fully and to love me entirely and to love me so wonderfully that any other love that's added will be just that, an addition and not that which makes me complete. Father, there's some here who are in relationships and for the sake of seeking confirmation are laying those relationships right down here at the altar saying, God, my relationship with you is the most important thing. Give them that grace to do so. Resist and fight every area of brokenness that would attempt to wrestle with them about making that decision. And give them the grace even that Abraham had in the moment where he had to lay his son down for the sake of truth. And God, I thank you that as they do that, you're going to honor them, bless them, restore them, and increase them in ways that transcends anything that they can ever imagine. We seal these words, we seal these prayers, we seal these times, this time, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Valentine's Day to you. We love you very much. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious toward you. May he lift up his countenance over you and grant you shalom, shalom in Jesus' name. God bless you. Hope to see you uh, Saturday, Wednesday night. It's going to be a special a marriage service. You don't want to miss that. And wholeness is available in the bookstore. God bless you. Love you.